Conversations about Geology. Today's topic is the famous Hampton Butte Green Petrified Wood. For your reference, I would suggest looking up on the internet examples of images of the Hampton Butte Green Petrified Wood. The volcanic eruptive sounds you are about to hear were the most dominant geologic sounds heard in Oregon over the last 283 million years. Volcanic eruptions were instrumental in producing so much of the geology we will be discussing today and on future shows. My name is Gib Bernhardt and I am pleased to be the host for Conversations About Geology. This program will initially be a 15 to 20 minute conversation about various questions I've been asked about geology. Most of the programs will be about Oregon geology with some forays into Northern California Nevada, Idaho, and Washington to help explain the history of the rocks. Generally, when folks find out I'm a geologist, they tell me how much they love rocks and show me some of their favorite or prettiest rocks. They often ask two specific questions. What type of rock is it and how old is the rock? Identifying the rock is relatively easy. To determine its age, I have to know about where they found the rock in order to have a bit of a clue as to its age. Then if there is time available, I will talk about the processes that form this specific rock, about the age of the rock, the geography, climate, and environment that the rock was deposited into or upon. Thankfully, the student who asked the question regarding the green petrified wood knew exactly where the rocks were found and had the patience to wait for a complete answer after about three weeks of research. The following program is based on that research. Most of us know what petrified wood is. Petrified wood is the name given to a special type of fossilized remains of terrestrial vegetation. It is the result of a tree, a tree-like plant, having completely transitioned to stone by the process of permineralization. All the organic materials have been replaced with minerals, mostly a silicate such as quartz, while retaining the original structure of the stem tissue. By the end of this program, the complete process will be better understood. First, I want to discuss the formation that the Hampton Buttes petrified wood is found within, and this will involve some discussion about the geologic history of eastern and central Oregon. The state of Oregon has not always been a landmass extending from around the western border of Idaho to the present-day coastline. At the end of the Paleozoic, the western border, or the Cratonic edge of the United States, extended from Puget Sound, curving towards Spokane and eastern Washington, continuing southward to the Blue Mountains, skirting along the northern and eastern margin of the Blue Mountains and the Klamath Mountains, continuing southward along the western border of Idaho, and on into central Nevada and further southward. The continental shelf and slope extended about 150 miles to the west and terminated at the then location of the Farallon subduction zone. During the Mesozoic, various exotic terrains that comprised the Blue Mountains and Klamath Mountains were in place. What are exotic terrains? An exotic terrain is a block of land that collided with a continent along a convergent margin and attached to the continent. The term exotic terrain implies that the land was not originally part of the continent to which it is now attached. When the denser marine plate subducts beneath the less dense continental plate and the subducting marine plate reaches a depth of about 60 to 75 miles, the water contained within the plate dehydrates out of the plate as a superheated steam and melts mantle rock above it. The melted rock is less dense than the surrounding mantle rock and rises as a bubble into the continental crust and eventually erupts at the surface forming volcanic island arcs. These volcanic island arcs are the exotic lands that eventually collide with and adhere to the continental crust. This process that formed the Blue and Klamath Mountains ended at the end of Jurassic about 145 million years ago. 
the jam conversion or subduction zone jumped, relocated just east of where someday the high cascades will be located and reinitiated. During the Cretaceous period and until the end of the Mesozoic era, the new continental shelf between the western border of the Blue Mountains and the Klamath Mountains and the new subduction zone began to fill with sediments that eroded off of the Blue Mountains and the Klamath Mountains. The new subducting plate descended at a shallower angle causing compressional stress that thickened the crust of western North America and the subduction angle was too shallow to allow volcanism to occur. This same marine oceanic plate was transporting the Silesia Plateau and volcanic arc during the Paleocene epoch of the Cenozoic era. By the end of the Paleocene, around 54 million years ago, Silesia, riding on the marine plate, collided with and jammed up the subduction zone. The descending plate east of the jammed region, on the continental side, broke and began to sink at a steeper angle, reinitiating magma genesis at a 60 to 70 mile depth, giving rise to the Clarno volcanoes and the Clarno formation. The volcanic source for the Clarno formation was the wildcat caldera in the, in the Ochoco Mountains that erupted between 43.8 to 36 million years ago during early Eocene epoch of the tertiary period. Outcropping widely throughout central Oregon, the Clarno Formation includes almost 6,000 feet of deposits. It consists of both andesitic volcanic rocks and volcanogenic sedimentary rocks. The Clarno Formation includes lava flows, tuffs, pyroclastic flows, lahars, mudstone, and conglomerates. By far the most abundant type of material issuing from these new volcanoes were rhyolitic ash. Rhyolite lavas are very explosive due to high silica and gas content, hence the reason why rhyolitic airfall ash dominated the landscape, depositing thousands of feet of ash on the ground, burying the landscape and vegetation upon it. In some cases, pyroclastic flows raced down the sides of the volcanoes and spread across the countryside, further burying the landscape in meters of ash. A pyroclastic flow is a fast-moving current of hot gas and volcanic matter, collectively known as tephra, which reaches speeds moving away from a volcano of up to 450 miles per hour. The gases can reach temperatures of about 1,830 degrees Fahrenheit. Pyroclastic flows normally touch the ground and hurtle downhill or spread laterally under gr gravity. I can only imagine the terror the animals must felt when ashfall and or large pyroclastic flows engulfed them in the floor of the land. However, this horrid environment was perfect for preservation of animals and vegetation by petrification. 44 million years ago, Central Oregon was a hot, wet, semi-tropical place filled with a wide diversity of plants. At that time, Oregon was located about 700 miles southeast of today's position. More than 175 species of fruits and nuts preserved in the fossil records suggest a forest more diverse than any modern ecosystem in this part of the world. The forest was dense and moist, receiving an annual rainfall of 3 meters, almost 10 feet. But this semi-tropical environment, very like southern Mexico, was home to more than just trees and plants. The forest also echoed with the buzzing of insects, the calls of birds, and the footfall of mammals. The flora was made up of predominantly angiosperms, flowing plants like magnolias, and gymnosperms, seed-bearing plants like walnuts. Many of the petrified wood fossils include willows, cottonwood, walnuts, pines, lauras, an extinct palm plant called Sabalites, and Katsura. Today, Katsura are hardwoods that can reach heights up to 100, 148 feet, or one of the largest hardwoods found in Asia. The site where the green petrified wood was obtained was found on BLM land about two miles north of Hampton Buttes, and approximately 10.3 miles north-northwest of the intersection of U.S. Highway 20 and Van Lakes Roads. The petrified wood was found in soils developed from the Clarno Formation. 
This location is perhaps the most southerly exposure of the Clarno Formation in Oregon, approximately 50 miles southeast of its source at Wildcat Caldera. Organisms entombed in sediments such as volcanic ash, which become saturated with water, may petrify or permineralize under the right pH and temperature conditions. Silicified wood, like the Hampton Butte petrified trees, were buried in volcanic ash. As stated earlier, rapid burial in volcanic ash is the initial stage for many fossil woods preserved with silica. Volcanic ash acts as an abundant source of silica for groundwater. The presence of water is important for several reasons. It reduces oxygen, thereby inhibiting tissue deterioration from aerobic fungi, acts as an agent for the alteration of ash, maintains wood shape for maximum permeability, and creates a medium for the transport and deposition of silica. The conditions of temperature and pressure during fossil wood formation are equivalent to those found in sedimentary environments at shallow depth. Excessive pressure would deform wood shape and tissues. Excessive temperatures above 1800 degrees Fahrenheit break down wood substances. The pH of the sediment laden water within the wood is probably neutral to slightly acidic. Wood chemically breaks down at pH values below 4.5 and above 7. Silica is highly soluble at a pH above 9. The weathering of volcanic ash may produce a pH that is quite high, alkaline, which would release silica into solution, making it available for emplacement in wood as the pH is lowered. These physical and chemical parameters can help to define the environmental conditions in which wood can act as a template for silica. When wood is permeated by silica solution, hydrogen bonding links silicic acid to hydroxyl groups on cellulose making up the inner cell wall. Silica that initially fixes to the wood structure is amorphous, a form of quartz called opal. This amorphous silica is unstable and slowly crystallizes to form stable forms. The transition to more stable forms of silica involves continued polymerization and water loss. Higher order forms of opal are created through the, this process and eventually lead over time to the thermodynamically more stable silica quartz called chalcedony. One may ask, how long does it take for wood to become petrified and then convert from an unstable opal to a stable uh, chalcedony? The initial emplacement of silica as a film may occur rapidly. Artificial silicification of wood in the lab and studies of natural silicified wood demonstrate that the physical state of silica in newly formed petrifications is amorphous and in the lab can occur within weeks. However, conversion of the silica to increasingly stable forms of opal and to, uh, then to chalcedony, which is a cryptocrystalline quartz, and finally to agates, which are microgranular quartz, requires millions of years. Under geothermal conditions, the same process may occur in 50,000 years or less. Pure quartz crystals are colorless but trace amounts of transition metals are the most common source of color in quartz family minerals and colored gems. Elements with atomic numbers between 21 and 29, scandium, titanium, vanadium, chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel, copper, have partially filled d orbitals. Electrons transitioning between d orbital positions absorb energy in the visible spectrum and minerals containing even trace amounts of these elements may have a very bright color. Generally, the following elemental co uh, contaminants provide the following colors. Carbon is black, cobalt green or blue, chromium green or blue, copper green or blue, iron oxides red, brown or yellow, manganese pink or orange and manganese oxides black. When you have a sample of petrified wood that shows variations in structure and colorization, it is evidence of a complex diagenetic history. 
diagenesis is any chemical, physical, or biological change undergone by a sediment after its initial deposition and lithification. This process excludes surface alteration by weathering and or metamorphism. Factors that produce complex coloration includes infiltration of silica along wood grains, red-green oxidation reduction processes, entry of groundwater along fractures and rot pockets within the wood, and bleaching of the exterior surface. The Hampton Buttes petrified wood is named for, but not a part of or associated with the Hampton Buttes volcanics that occurred during early Pliocene about 4 million years ago, or nearly 40 million years after, after the deposition of the eocene clarno volcanic deposits. One of our future stories may be about volcanism in the high plain of central Oregon. I hope you have enjoyed this program about the Hampton Butte petrified wood. This has been an interesting and educational journey from, for me from the construction of the Blue and Klamath Mountains to the docking of the Silesia terrain to the continental United States, the environmental conditions and geographic locations of the Kalarno during the Eocene epoch, the birth of the Wildcat Mountain Volcano and the distribution of the Clarno Formation that buried and permineralized the vegetation that formed the petrified wood at Hampton Buttes. I hope to have another show ready in a month that will be about some aspect of the geology along the central Oregon coast. If you are interested in learning more about geology of the Pacific Northwest, I'm teaching a three-hour course on the geology of the Pacific Northwest next semester at Oregon Coast Community College starting April 4th at 5 p.m. It would be wonderful to see you there. I hope you tune in again. I wish to thank my wife, Nancy Bernhardt, for co-producing this program, Frankie Trujillo Dalby and Bill Dalby at KYAQ for granting me the program and technical support and Dave Price of Oregon Coast Community College for help with advertising and the press release. Until we meet next time, please remember, we can only begin to predict the future from the evidence we have discovered from the past. I wish to close by saying that the world is a beautiful place and only our curiosity can make it meaningful. Until we meet next time, so long.